Today, Lon, we had the opportunity to watch you frame an opening and install a barn door. Talk about that for a minute, if you would. Main thing with the barn door is mounting the track at the correct height. If you have an existing opening and you're going to put a barn door on, there needs to be a flat board across the header to mount the track to. Then the measurements have to be taken from that track to order your door. If you have a door, then the track has to be mounted with the measurements from the door. Height mainly. Width is not that important, but height is the crucial part. As you saw today when we were putting this together, we used this door that we came from Bears to match the interior doors we have here. So that's the main thing. Some of the barn doors can get very, very heavy also. So it has to be mounted onto some solid backing before you can hang that door. And we were afforded the luxury today of being in a new construction job site, <clears throat> working with a somewhat standard rough opening, and then you dialed it in and framed your you finish jam it. into the size that you needed to accommodate a standard door. Most standard doors will not fit in a remodel or an existing opening. They're not tall enough. So you either buy a taller door and saw the bottom off or you have one made custom. Starting with a, a blank canvas, you were allowed to paint the picture you wanted. Correct. And, and, it, and Correct. it worked out beautifully. Yeah, we actually framed everything in from the size of the door. Yes. So yes. if you have the door size, you can work that direction. Folks need to know that there's a lot of options and a lot of, a lot of thinking that has to be done rather than just putting a standard door up on an it's existing It's just not that easy. Yes. yes. My name is Ben Baird. We're out here at Baird Brothers Sawmill in Canfield, Ohio today. Today we're going to be talking about the Copenhagen Corner. If you've ever ordered a countertop off of us or uh, acquired about a countertop, you may have been asked if you wanted a Copenhagen Corner on your countertop. Uh, you may have been offended. We want to clarify things today. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you what a Copenhagen Corner is. Um, it's got about a 2 and 9 16 diameter, the Copenhagen can itself. And when we say Copenhagen Corner, we're literally talking about taking a Copenhagen can and uh, making that, that radius out of it. So uh, let me go ahead, I'll, um, I'll mark this thing up for you guys. I'll cut it over here on the saw, we'll sand it, and then we'll go ahead and put an edge on it and let you guys see what we're talking about. So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll sand this corner down and then I'll follow it up with putting a uh, edge on it. Touch it up one more time with the sander. And as you guys can see here, we got a nice rounded corner, um, like we discussed earlier, the Copenhagen corner. Unlike Copenhagen, these corners are not addictive. So uh, there you are, that's a Copenhagen corner for you. Thank you and have a good day.
Hey everybody, my name is Ben Baird. Uh, we're out here at Baird Brothers Sawmill today in Canfield, Ohio. We're gonna cut into some doors, show you guys uh, entry level doors all the way up to maybe some higher end doors. So let me start with the hollow core door. That's a more of an entry level uh, lower end door and we'll cut into it and show you guys the benefits and disadvantages of it. So the first thing we're gonna do for you guys is we're gonna put these things on a scale and uh, get a weight for you just so you have an idea of what each door weighs. This door weighs roughly about 26, 27 pounds. But let's start, we'll take about three quarters of an inch off. This would be in case you got a new floor or a new rug and uh, had to cut the door down to make, make some more room. So right here, I'm marking it at uh, three quarters of an inch. When you're at home doing projects like this, doing home projects, uh, please keep in mind that safety is uh, always our first concern, especially here at Baird Brothers. And uh, we wanna make sure that you as the viewer is also being safe while you're doing these things. So as you guys can see, we took about um, three, three quarters of an inch off. The bottom is still solid. It still looks like a good door. Let's go ahead and let's cut a little bit more off. Uh, we'll take about an inch off this time. So as you guys can see on that last cut, we did get into the hollow core part of the door. Um, this is why this is an entry level door. Here at Baird Brothers, when we get orders for hollow core doors that need to be cut down to fit a specific size, um, we would just simply cork this with a wood uh, cork. Um, at home, that may pose a little bit of a problem if you don't have the capabilities of doing that, but that's what that would take to cork that door. I really wanna break into this thing though. Uh, let's tear this thing off and see what the inside of this door actually looks like. So kind of what I thought here, um, as you can see, there's really not much to this store. They actually have styrofoam in here um, holding these two pieces apart from each other. Uh, so there's really not much to this store. As you can see, it's actually pretty easy to break open. Uh, you're not gonna do this with a solid wood door. Um, and overall, the solid wood's just gonna be a better product and a better long lasting door. Let's go ahead and we'll jump up to the uh, solid core door and show you the benefits of that and why that might suit you a little bit better. All right, so the, the, the first thing I notice about the store, um, it's a lot heavier. I mean, you can just tell the quality of it is way better than that hollow core door. But let's go ahead, let's get this thing up on the scale um, just to show you guys exactly how much more it is than that hollow core door. So this one weighs about 42 pounds, as you guys can see. One of the benefits of the solid core over the hollow core as well is the sound. You're not gonna get sound, uh, it'll definitely act as a sound barrier compared to that hollow core door that's gonna let a lot more sound in and out of the room that you're in. So let's go ahead, we'll get this thing up on the saw for you guys. We'll take three quarters of an inch off and then bump it up and show you guys the inside of the door. So as you guys can see, the bottom of this door is still solid, um, still a good door. Um, we haven't breached into the middle of the door yet. So let's go ahead and let's take a little bit more off and uh, see what the inside of this door really looks like. So the bottom of this door uh, is still solid. Unlike on that hollow core door, there's still a solid chunk down here. So that's after our second cut. Um, so at home, if you, were to, if you were to cut this door down to replace a floor to add carpet or something, you wouldn't have to worry about corking it, whereas you do have to worry about that with the hollow core door. So the next door we're gonna talk about here is a, uh, it's a veneer red oak door. Definitely a very, very good product. Uh, whereas the previous two doors were molded doors, they're more paint ready. Um, this is a more stain ready door. It's about 49 pounds, so it's definitely got more weight to it than the previous two doors. I guess a disadvantage would be if you scratch this door, uh, it's pretty hard to repair because you don't have the actual red oak all the way through. It's just a red oak veneer face with some sort of solid hardwood behind it. So the bottom of this door, just like the other doors, still very solid, uh, very good door. Um, as you can see here, made in China. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you or not. Uh, that's just where we happen to get these doors from. If you're looking for a stain ready, natural wood look door, let's go ahead and we'll cut into this door like we did the previous doors. So the end of this door, um, you can just see the color change here. This is probably pine. Um, whereas the veneer facing on this door is a red oak. Very difficult and very hard to repair because of the veneer facing on it. Um, you can't sand the door down like you would be able to do a traditional solid door. 
So let's go ahead and we'll cut into this door a little bit more and see what the inside of the core looks like. So once again, this door, it's gonna look the same. Uh, you can cut into this thing the whole way up. It's never gonna change. You still have your solid wood the whole way through. Once again, it's just not solid red oak. Um, you have your red oak veneer facing with a solid pine interior on that. So now we're gonna go over one of our Baird made doors. This is a solid door. It's solid poplar the whole way through. Um, you can order this door in any species, but today we're gonna be cutting into a poplar door. Um, it's about 53, 54 pounds. Um, so it definitely is a little bit heavier. We'll go ahead and we'll put it up here and we'll cut into it to show you guys that it's solid the whole way through. So with this door, unlike the previous doors, um, you can order this in many different species. Uh, you can order it if you, wanna, if you want it paint ready, it can come paint ready. If you're looking for a stain grade uh, natural wood look in your house, um, we also offer many species that can get you that look. We'll start by taking three quarters of an inch off and we'll work our way up again. As you can see, it's solid poplar the whole way through. The rails are poplar, the door's poplar. Um, it doesn't have that veneer face like we saw in the previous store. So let's go ahead, let's take a big chunk off here just to show you guys that it really is solid hardwood the whole way. So I took a pretty good chunk off this time to really show you guys. That's why this is your best option. That's why uh, we strongly recommend that you guys come out. We'll show you all the doors. The solid door is definitely the best store. You might ask, which door is best for me? Well, I strongly recommend you to jump on our website, learn about our product, read about our doors, call one of our salesmen, uh, come out to our showroom here in Campfield, Ohio. We'll make you a quality door that fits your budget and fits your style. Thanks for joining us today and have a good day. Hello, my name is Ben Baird. We're out here at Baird Brothers Sawmill today in Canfield, Ohio. Today we're gonna to be talking about the two main differences between MDF and our finger jointed material that we make here at Baird Brothers Sawmill. So this is the MDF and then this is our finger jointed material. We just take little short pieces of wood and rejoin them together to create a beautiful piece of molding that you can put up in your house and paint. Just so you can see the back of that, that's what uh, the MDF would look like on the back side. So here I'm gonna show you two, uh, two pieces of baseboard. On the top is the MDF product, on the bottom is our finger jointed product that we make at Baird Brothers here. So once again, I'll slide this product off so you guys can see the strength difference in the two. So as you can see, the MDF is very flimsy. Um, when you hold it flat, very, very flimsy, not a very strong product. Um, if you grab our finger joint baseboard, you're not going to see that. Very, very durable, very strong, very well put together. So now that we discussed the durability of both, I'd like to touch on price point a little bit. They say on average to trim out a 2,000 square foot house, it costs about $600 more to use my finger jointed material compared to this MDF product. Now just real quick, just to show you guys, like I said, this is crown right here. Um, I don't know about you, but if I'm hanging crown on my own, uh, this is pretty easy to hold over my head and work with. Now, if I'm by myself and I take this piece and try to hang it, I'm gonna have a heck of a time doing that on my own. Our finger joint material is definitely worth the money. Um, it's a great product. Like I said, it's not, it's not junk wood that we're making this product with. It's just simply cutoffs that have not made it through with the rest of the lumber that we're simply sending back through a finger joiner, gluing them together and making a beautiful, beautiful piece of molding for your home. So the last thing I wanna show you guys here today is the, uh, the difference in strength between the two. I'm just simply gonna go ahead and try to break the finger joint and try to break the MDF and we'll see which one breaks uh, easier or if they even break. So um, we'll start with the uh, finger jointed uh, baseboard. I'll see if I can break it real quick. So we were able to break it, but let's see uh, if we're able to break this MDF. That was quite a bit easier than the finger jointed material was. I guess you could see how, mu how much better our product is, how much stronger it is. It's far superior than the industry standard. Um, you saw how easy it was for me to break that MDF compared to the finger joint material. Um, I strongly encourage you guys to jump on our website, check our product out, read about our product, learn about it. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to call. 
We ship all 50 states and service all, all of Canada. So with all that being said, thank you very much for watching and enjoy your day. At Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, it is our mission to be stewards of our natural resources. Sustainability doesn't just benefit our current generation, but it lays the groundwork for many future generations to come. Using our natural resources responsibly is a top priority, and it starts well before the lumber reaches us. Timber is one of the most renewable natural resources, and when harvested correctly, will leave room for healthy new growth. At Baird Brothers, we effort to partner with responsible logging and sawmill companies that harvest in a sustainable way through methods like select cutting. These methods ensure that forests are maintained and will regenerate for generations to come. Once the timber reaches us at Baird Brothers, we take every step to ensure sustainability. We use nearly every inch of the harvested lumber and are constantly looking for ways to reduce waste. In receiving this natural resource, we take responsibility for it. We have to take care of it through the whole process, through the sticking process, through the drying process, into manufacturing, and then our finished products. We are able to use cutoffs for products like our finger jointed molding line and workbench tops. We are proud to generate our electricity at Baird Brothers going back to 1981. Materials that would otherwise be thrown out are ground into sawdust and we use that to generate heat for our dry kilns and our buildings. Even the heat produced by our off-the-grid electrical generators is reused to power our kilns. At Baird Brothers, we strive to have a small environmental footprint. Our founders implemented green business practices almost 40 years ago, and we are proud to continue that legacy and make sure the future is bright for the next generations. To learn more, go to BairdBrothers.com. So here at Baird Brothers, one of the things that sets us apart from uh, other companies is some of the technology that we introduce into our manufacturing process. Now, mind you, a lot of our products still demand the old one-two of a human eye and human hands. This building houses a very advanced machine. It's an MRI for wood, more or less. Let's talk to somebody about it that knows a whole lot more about it, and that'd be Terry Baird. Let's go on in. Hi, I'm Terry Baird with Baird Brothers Sawmill, and uh, we're showing our four-sided scanner that we use for optimizing our cross-cut operation. This is our four-sided scanner. It's a wood eye manufactured in Sweden. It's uh, using a combination of cameras and lasers to check profile and defects in our lumber, and it allows us to maximize the yield of our lumber with uh, precision detection. And it kind of moves us up in technology, trying to keep us on the leading edge. Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods offers over 2,000 molding profiles. In our grinding room here, we have several thousand profiles. Uh, we're always, uh, every day we're adding multiple profiles. We have this knife library available online for everyone to search through. They can um, select what size range they're looking for, or what architectural style. So you can go through that knife library, see if we have something that's a match to what you're looking for, or you can reach out to us um, send us a sample, send us a drawing, uh, a picture. Uh, we can start with a picture to get your pricing and we can match up exactly uh, what you have and whether you need 10 feet of it or you need 10,000 feet, it's never a problem. Besides selection, Baird Brothers sells only the highest quality of fine hardwood moldings. This is determined by knife marks. Knife marks are tiny lines in wood created during the milling process by a knife cutting the molding profile. The amount of knife marks determines the quality of the millwork of the wood. The more knife marks per inch, the higher the quality. Knife marks per inch or 
kmpi are measured by board feed speeds, RPMs of the cutters, and the number of knives. While industry standard is about 12 kmpi, Baird Brothers standard kmpi comes in much higher at 18 kmpi. Because Baird Brothers knife marks are so fine, they aren't as noticeable unless you're looking extremely close. But as we look down the board, we want to also make sure we don't have any any scratches in there, any scuffs from the hold downs, any nicks in the knives if you catch a piece of dirt or a piece of a foreign object that might uh, from the raw material that might hit the blade and nick it. As soon as that happens, you have to stop, you have to resharpen and get rid of that nick because you'll have a bump in your moldings. Doll knives create noticeable marks in the wood while unbalanced cutters can leave defects in the wood. This is especially noticeable on stained surfaces. Nothing can go on out there with the molders until it comes out of this room. It needs to be sharp, it needs to be precise. Um, if we have a profile that we've used for 20 years, we will be within a half a thou of exactly the same right now as how that came out 20 years ago. And that's the only thing that they will accept here. And that's the only thing that we will sell. This is why Baird Brothers has experts that weigh, balance, and precisely sharpen every molding profile knife. The knives we put into a head, the proper size, and then ground to the profile, which is done to a template. Everything's got to be smooth and locked in tight and clean. And every knife gets sharpened exactly the same way every time. Whatever the degree of the bevel is, we match. There's a reason why it's on there. Obviously, it runs that profile better, so we'll match it. Basically, the tolerance that I've been taught that has to be done here is within half a thou which is, you can barely see it, but it's that critical to make sure every piece of molding that comes out is exactly the same. This template used 10 years ago is gonna create the same molding today as it did 10 years ago. I can usually feel with my hands how sharp they're getting, and I can take my thumbnail and just actually take the thumbnail right off as sharp as it's going to get. Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, America's source for fine hardwoods. There you go, Dale. Thanks. Hello, Steve Stack here at Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Today we're just receiving some hardwood lumber, getting ready to start the process to manufacture some of the high quality dimensional lumber. One of the many products we offer here at Baird Brothers in receiving this natural resource, we take responsibility for it through the sticking process, through the drying process, into the manufacturing, and then we'll see the finished product. So let's go for a walk. So we're in one of our rough lumber warehouses and we want to discuss a little bit uh, about our drying process and the importance of our drying process. As you can see, the bunks of lumber behind me are on what we refer to as stickers or being stuck lumber. The stick itself is a fluted material allowing uh, air transfer. So we can get it down to that six to 8% moisture content level where we can manufacture it and know that it's going to wind up in your projects as a true kiln dried product, very stable, very straight, very flat. Baird Brothers takes a lot of pride in their drying capabilities, and we do it right. So now we find ourselves in the middle of our main manufacturing finished mill facility. Once the materials pass through the molder, whether it be 1x4 poplar or 1x12 red oak, the next step is going to be going to the sander. So we're going to produce a product that surface four sides in whatever dimension you want, from the 1x2 to the 2x12, and then we're going to pick that premier face and run it through our wide belt sander and getting it one step closer to make it one step easier for you to use that product in your projects.
Well, we made it over to one of our warehouses where we store all of our finished molding products and our, uh, our dimensional lumber. Here at Baird's, we offer the red oak, the white oak, the cherries, the poplar, all of, all of your native hardwood species. Every time one of our employees lays a hand on a board, it's an opportunity for us to make sure that you, as our end user, winds up with a high quality product, whether it be the ripping operation in our optimizing line or on our manufacturing floor as it goes through the molders. We stack the material. It's, it's getting a set of human eyes on it again to ensure that when you pick it up here at Baird's or whether we ship it to you across the United States, you're receiving a quality product. Hey, thank you for joining us today. It's been our pleasure having you. You want more information, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell, and be up to speed on everything we have going on, new and exciting here at Baird Brothers. <clears throat> okay, Lonnie, so we did, we did a few projects today. Uh, behind us is this double door unit. Uh, typically available, pre-hung, delivered out to the job site, either with a double door uh, roller ball catch or an optional magnetic catch scenario, or set up with a T-astrical, uh, where the doors are divided by a T-astrical, which is, uh, allows you to install it in a, in a privacy function, going into, say, a master bedroom, a uh, master bath, a, a library or study, something like that. But in this scenario, they're not the old magnetic hitch that we're all used to. <laughs> this is this is a new little hybrid. Uh, how do you feel about that? And if you would, go ahead and I'll sure. open the door and you point go it ahead. out to, to everyone, okay? Sure. The new magnets were drilled in flush into the jam and there's also one on the door. The old ball catches had a strike plate per se, a little piece of metal that had a little hole in it and there was a spring-loaded ball on top of the door and that ball would compress when you closed the door and pop back up to hold the door in place. So the door always had a wiggle in it, always had a wobble, and it made a noise when you put it in. Then you had to push it shut. These new magnets, you just get this door close and it's gonna close by itself. Now you hear the bumping noise, and once the door's painted and finished, then we put little bumpers in and that stops that banging noise. But these are so much nicer than the ball or the roller catches. So this was a great improvement to the double doors, in my opinion. So the property we're on today is primarily a farm. The timber on it is extremely large. It's been growing for a long time. We select the trees that are damaged already trees that are showing signs of rot. The timber we're cutting today is going to be used for a lot of things. Uh, we've got grade timber here that's going to go through the sawmill and be used for furniture. It'll be used for flooring. It'll be used for moldings. You'll get some good grade lumber off the outer jacket, uh, the outside edges of the timber, and you'll also end up in, in the middle, you'll end up with uh, a railroad tie. So for sustainability, uh, the big thing we have to remember is, is it something we can continue to do forever? Um, and by cho choosing to do things the right way, we can do that. Timber is one of our most renewable natural resources. We've got the ability to harvest timber today as long as we do it the right way. We're selecting the right trees, selling them at the right time, and also have young trees always growing for the future so that my grandchildren and their grandchildren are also able to use those resources to meet the needs of, of everyday living. All right, so after I establish that, the next thing I usually do is I take, I grab, I take the door, and the door comes with stops and it's, these are stops and these are pre-mounted on the door when you get a, a pre-hung door from Baird Brothers. And I remove these stops, I take them off and what I do is I drill holes in the jam all the way down behind the stop. And I countersink them 
and I take screws and then I'll screw my frame to the, to the wood stud behind. And the reason why is I won't have a lot of nasty nail holes in and, it. And, and that's where I was going. I had, I had two trains of thought while you were explaining that. <clears throat> Number one, typically you'll see, you'll see a, a nail out on this edge right. and to this edge. Right. Okay, so you've concealed that. Number one. Number two, going back to the weight of this door. Correct. Now it's an inch and three quarter door. I'm looking at four inch hinges. Mm -hmm. Okay, but those hinges are only as good as how they're fastened to the door, to the yeah. jam, and the jam to the wall. Yeah, on the heavier doors, we use ball bearing hinges and it makes the door just work a lot smoother. You wanna make sure you get a good quality hinge when you're hanging these doors too. Because of the weight of them, you want it to not bend or twist. Hey guys, Steve Stack here, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, back at Studio 3B. I have, I have my buddy with me today, Paul, Smiley Strahirish from Master Plan Builders. How you doing, buddy? Good. Good, Steve. Hey, glad gonna, to be here. I'm gonna pick your brain a little bit. There's a slim pickings, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you you know, design trends right now. We're seeing a lot of it here. Anything from the contemporary still to the the modern farmhouse to the rustic kind of farmhouse, right? Behind us here, this is one of the doors that we manufactured. Uh, back here in our workshop studio. What are they looking at? Are they looking at some of the rustic stuff right now? Yes, we are We are doing some of this. It's not as prevalent as our craftsman look, I guess, right now, but the farmhouse look is becoming a popular look. And we, we do it, this is a little bit more of a rough song, but we do it out of some little refined materials like, like the white oak wow. uh, product. You know, you can achieve this, but get it in just a little bit more refined. And that's a good way to put it because the craftsman look versus this is strict rustic. Yeah, this this right, is strictly right. rustic. This is a part of our antique collection with the saw curve and the band marks in it. We offer a flooring line like this also, but it's definitely to the edge of the rustic. I mean, it's, it's full blown rustic. To your point though, you might do a, a conventional craftsman finish the interior of a home, this might be a splash for, say, we'll take this door and use it as a barn door. A barn door. Right? Pantry door, we do a lot of different looks in, in pantries now, where we, you know, we do some of this, even with an, with an etched glass, or, you know, maybe a rain glass, something antique looking, looks really nice, like, like the old, old days, you know, and then this would, this would really remind yeah, me of. Exactly. And, and, and you did point out this with the saw curves, because that is something that you don't see a lot of, you know, so people really have to like this rustic look, and if not, you can get into these panels, which are, you know, traditional wood grain or traditional graining, but you don't get the, the soft cursor or the quarter sawn look to it, you know, where you do with, with some of the oaks and some of the more, uh, you know, the rustic look. This is starting to creep up slowly. Get a little bit of yes. traction, get mm -hmm. a little bit of yes. traction. Folks, you heard it. Master Plan Builders, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, we'll take you where you wanna go, whether it be the rustic, the craftsman, We'll yep. fill the needs, right? You got it. Yes, All sir. right, Smiley. Yep. Hey, thanks for joining me this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, folks. Steve Stack, Bear Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Back here at Studio 3B, I'm joined by our buddy, Paul Straherich, longstanding partner of, of Bear Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Today, we're going to talk about, real quick, design and we see it becoming real popular, Smiley, in the Craftsman series, the Shaker series, and through finishes, you can tweak that. You can take it from a modern farmhouse to give it a little contemporary flair. Something I was taught long ago, and you've experienced it, the staircase, nucleus of the house, okay? All the stuff you introduce, whether it be painted doors, natural hardwood doors, it all generates or comes from the staircase. Is, we're going back to the old box yeah. knoll. I yeah. mean, this was used yeah. eons ago, right? Right, right. The shaker, craftsman style, it's, it's, it's become real popular. I mean, this is our go-to post right now. And we team it up with something that's just a little more, you know, fine lines as far as handrail goes, just a little cleaner lines. The colonial twisted 
it's kind of ran its course and people want cleaner lines. They want less clutter, you know? So we, we see this, this is just a, a nice, it still gives you detail, but it doesn't give you all that ornate. Uh, it's, it's an accent, you know. not a statement. And you could blend, you can blend a lot of different products with this, you know? So you can go to, to the- Hey, you know, I, I, I've been on job sites and the iron is real popular right now, right? right. So you have, you have options. Natural finish on the knoll post, the handrail, the actual banister rail itself, or it can be painted. And then with your, with your balusters, whether you do a wood baluster and really keep it in that shaker in that component, right? right? That craftsman look, or whether you want to introduce a little bit of style and color in the iron line, yeah. whether it be something as, as straightforward as this, this uh, half inch square, Iron, iron baluster. That, that, honestly, it's funny that we're talking about this because our last probably four staircases have been this look. This can get stained, you know, medium to dark colors. It's poplar, but we use a white oak that looks beautiful with a natural finish on it. We add black into it as, as a baluster look, and it's and you know you get a little bit of both worlds because people are using black as an accent color a lot lately with furniture and different things. So it, it picks up the staircase, and again, and if you stain these or keep them natural, you, you know, you could always paint them years down the road when they right. when they wear, if they get some look to it. So, and I tell people all the time that when they're looking for a color on a, on a baluster, you can only go black, but black is timeless. It never goes out where, you know, exactly. the, the old red bronze is gonna leave us someday, but good old black never will. Hey, so, but. you know what? There's a lot of options in stair components. We offer them here at Baird Brothers. You guys install them over at Master Plan Builders. Uh, have fun with it, right? Yeah, that's I mean, yeah. It, it, yep. it, it can make a statement and still be functional. I tell people, get on Bear Brothers' website and look for design work and, and, and send us a picture and, we, and we'll do it because some of them we have done already anyway. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So. Smiley, thanks for joining me today. Guys, keep following BairdBrothers.com. Visit our friends over at MasterPlan.com and uh, every day's a challenge, appreciate man. You having, yeah. Appreciate you having me. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Okay. All right, Steve, we're back at the table saw here. I've only been woodworking a couple years, but for people who are just learning about the table saw, what are some, some things you would really want to hit home on to make them be able to operate it safely? Great piece of equipment. As with any woodworking equipment, complete respect is demanded from it. Mm -hmm. They're called accidents. Some are self-created. Other times they just happen on their own. You try and prevent. So we're working with the saw stop 10 inch contractor model saw, uncrated this a few months ago, put it together, went together very nice, and it does everything we need it to do in this size shop. We approach it every time we start it up with respect. I've unplugged it because we're talking about it and we're gonna have our hands around the blade and everything. So when you're not using it, unplug it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your guide fence. The guide fence needs to be parallel to the saw blade, why? So that you get straight cuts. And you don't get that pinch or that bind on the saw blade, right? right? So in setting it up, a lot of the companies will walk you through that process if you need to adjust your fence parallel to the blade. Some of that is done back here on the T portion of the fence mm -hmm. and you get everything nice and straight and you've used our saw before. Mm -hmm. There's no bind, there's no tension, so we like that. The fence is, of course, movable. Yep. You can run the fence on either side of, of this model. If you're doing cross-cutting work, you bring out this little guy. Okay. And just like our treads, if we wanted, we could set this up, maybe put an, a fence extension on the back of this, mm -hmm and use this as a push and we're nice and square. This body and your blade assembly is 90 degrees square, right? Okay. Again, no bind. Right. The adjustments on this saw, you have a height adjustment controller over here. You have an angle set down below here and that's important why. If I reveal the blade, Okay, down here, and if we move this board into it, okay, this has all the safety precautions of saw stop. Mm -hmm. 
if your saw does not. If you run the blade just above the stock thickness, mm -hmm. God forbid there would be a follow through accident, mm -hmm. all right, you're cutting your finger set at this height. If you crank that blade way up, you're cutting your finger off. Right. Right. So that's important also. And learn the equipment before you start your work. Be cautious, learn to be comfortable. Christy, over the last couple of years, your comfort level has probably came up. Yep. Through operating time, right? Yeah. What else about this saw do people need to be cautious of and the different tasks the saw can perform? Two things that come to mind right away, for me personally, I'll be honest, I was pretty intimidated when I was first learning how to use a table saw. There's a lot of force here, um, but I learned to keep my body to the left side of the blade. So when I'm pushing material through on this side, I'm staying out of the way should this wood come back. Um, so that's the main thing is positioning my body to the left side of the blade. Another thing, this is a really important piece of equipment here and this black splitter. This keeps the wood from binding back on itself as it progresses through the blade. It's called a writhing knife. This is also an anti-kickback feature. You can see the little spikes on it. So once your wood passes through it, it keeps it from being able to come back on you. So those are a couple things that I really take to heart. So Christy, long and short of it, uh, familiarize yourself with your with the table saw or any other piece of woodworking equipment. Go slow. Go slow, learn it. It has characteristics. Mm -hmm. Be cautious of it and respect it. And it'll do a lot of work for you. Exactly. All right? Yep, I agree. Thank you. You're welcome. Christy. Yes, sir. Let's talk about this new tool to our shop. Uh, miter box, crosscut saw, chop saw. Yeah. Right? Here everybody call them chop saws. I right. mean, in, in the day that they only had one function. Take us through it. Well, I think people are calling them chop saws because the main mechanism here that you can do is by chopping down and simply just cutting a board straight across it. But also have the ability to rotate the base and do angled cuts if you need to, uh, trim or baseboard, that's useful. You can also, give me a hand here, this is loose I think, tilt this if you're doing crown molding for instance. Okay, that just bottomed out on a 45 degree cut, right? You can get those nice bevel cuts for crown molding. So yep. those are a couple of the main uses for the miter saw in the shop. Let's see if I can get this back. You got it. There we go. Line it up, lock it up. Couple other great uses for a miter saw would be for making the same cut over and over again, right? This little guy is a locking mechanism here, so you can put a piece of scrap wood down and you can keep making that same cut over and over and over without having to remeasure every time. This saw addresses a nice width of, yeah. of of cutting surface. You can go 11 and a half inch plus on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, this comes with the sliding support wings on it. Right. Uh, so if you're, if you're doing something standing. A little taller. Right, a little taller. Or if you're setting a crown mold in there and you need that additional height to seat the crown at the angle. So it, it, it comes with a, a lot. Uh, not the most expensive saw on the market. Uh, but a very versatile saw. I really like this mobile stand too. That way, if you don't have a dedicated shop space for a saw like this, you can move it around. You can even take it out in the driveway and get your project done out there. You know, and that's one of the things we've kind of paid attention to in, in our limited shop here, uh, mobility, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be our workbenches or our table saw has a right. mobile base on it. We can, you know, one person move, move that heavy monster and uh, yeah. Great tool. Pretty safe overall. Same basic woodworking principles. You gotta respect the machine. Respect the machine. It has safety features built in. The blade's either in contact with the wood or it's protected mm -hmm. with, the blade is being protected out front here. And uh, common sense, respect the tool, 
and always know where your hands are at. Yep. What do you think? I agree. Let's make some sawdust. Let's do it. Hey everybody, welcome back. Steve Stack with Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. I find myself with a friend, uh, Mr. Mike Jenkins, our resident uh, woodworking tool historian. And, and we've, uh, we've had some conversation. Yes, we have. And uh, we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper. And you have a beautiful example, Mike, of a crown molder plane. You brought this along with you today, and we manufacture a product today. Very similar. Very similar. And uh, take, us, take us through the components of this crown molder. Okay. First of all, we have the body. This body is about four and a half inches wide, uh, probably 16 inches long. This is the wedge that holds the blade in place. The blade has a curvature. You can see that this cuts a big cove. When this plane was in production and was being used, it took a lot of effort to push this through a piece of wood. So these handles up here were to be used by the apprentice or the helper and the, the helper would pull this, help pull this plane while the craftsman, the master, was pushing it and guiding it. And you can imagine, starting off with a piece of wood this thick or so, it took several passes to get this curvature. This is not an easy process. It would have taken several passes to get to this process. And Steve, you have this process modified in t the 21st century. We do, we do. And, and I'm, I'm standing here listening and learning, and you referred to the actual cutter blade, uh, the wedge. Yes. So to my understanding, to the bottom surface of this, to start out, you're just going to allow a minimal blade projection past the sole of this just, crown molder. Just a touch and every pass gets a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper. Until you accomplish the full profile depth yes. of... That's not a fun day at work. Um, that is a day's work. <laughs> right? So, jump ahead. We have a magnificent crew in the shop and today these are done on motorized molders, okay, taking the place of this early piece of a crown molder. Very specific. Our molders today, we accomplish a profile with different cutter heads. So this cutter head is the exact profile of that knife, of this crown molding. Uh, our guys in our grinding department, mm -hmm extremely sharp, they work off of a master template, so we have consistency in our run. Uh, the cutter heads are inserted into a motor head. Circulating cylinder. A cylinder that slides onto a shaper shaft, more or less, mm -hmm. and spins at a very high rate RPM. Uh, they're stationary, per se, and the blank molding board passes underneath or over top of. And that's the exception the because when this plane was used, this is a stationary piece and this is what moves. Just the opposite. Yes. Just the opposite. Uh, this machine has a nice little on and off switch. <laughs> this machine has a very ugly on and off switch. But think back, how many miles of moldings that thing may have made? Well, you think about a room, 16 by 20, what you got, 16, 32, 42, 62, 80 feet of molding just yeah. to go around one room. Yes, and a lot of the more well-to-do homes in the day 
crown molding was throughout yes. the entire home. And it wasn't a singular piece of crown. It may have been a compound crown of three or four components. Right. There was a lot of time spent just making the molding to make that room look pretty. Just like us, uh, we address our sawdust situation daily. And I'm sure they had a cleanup crew at the end of the, <laughs> end of the day too because they were making some shavings. Right. Right? Well, hey, Mike, thanks for sharing that with us. Folks, stay tuned. We're going to have some more conversation. We're going to talk about some other tools. I look forward to it. Having too much fun, Mike. Thank you. You bet. Hey, folks. Steve Stack back here at Studio 3B, joined by Kevin Tarkovich, my buddy from Renovation Hunters. And, and uh, Kevin brought some tools along, one of them being the Crescent brand. You're familiar with this. The first adjustable wrench, right? First adjustable wrench by Crescent. You know, fabulous. The evolution, pump pliers. Crescent has supplied us with an assortment of tools, old product line, new product line, stuff that we have come to rely on during the construction process. Not only have they outfitted us with some nice bags. I like that, I really like that. The uh, trusty tape measure that you can never find. I think we have maybe 40 of them and we still gotta look for them. <laughs> innovative feature. This is the highlighted, it's called the night eye. So for failing eyesight or low light conditions. You're holding it, you're holding that out of ways. You can and, see and I can see those 30 second hash marks. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, that's become a critical tool. Now, probably if any of you have had a father who had any carpentry skills, you have broken multiple ones of these in your childhood. I know I have but it's the old trusty foot rule. I mean, you can't go wrong. It's old proven tools, just like their crescent wrenches that, uh, you know, you've come to rely on in the construction business, especially doing trim carpentry. This, invaluable. Everybody's had a, some form of speed square. This one with crescents yeah. adjustable. So, so anybody that's ever used them, right? I mean, you, you and I, it's in, it's in my right hand pouch, mm -hmm. right? It never leaves there. But the convenience of this being in your pouch in the closed position, but let's say that I'm taking and I'm using this not as a marking tool, but as a straight edge. And I'm cutting a piece of one by 12. Now I have a beautiful saw guide and I'm taking that entire one by 12 cut. Or like I say, the convenience of collapsing it. You still have nice clean edges in my pouch, out of sight, out of mind, but at hand. This, this, this one won me over out in Hyannis, Nebraska. Hyannis. That's where I was first introduced to that and I thought that is too cold. You know, there's multiple things you can do with a square. Oh. Uh, if you're doing roofs, yeah. hips common, all of that um, alignment, you know, scoring, it's, it's all there. It's no, at the I, ready all the time. I think you know, I utilize that to uh, lay out the stair treads, the risers yeah. on the uh, the porch out in Hyannis, uh, which you would normally need a 12 by 24 yeah. square to do. Trimming square. And for trim, all that, you can generate your reveal off the edge. And when your trim doesn't go well, <laughs> <laughs> you or you might need a little adjustment. There's, there's, there's two must haves right there, right? This is a nasty little cat claw, as I call it. Right, that can get into some places and dig some nails out. It's got a nice edge on it too, but that little guy. That's that's your finessing. This is gets you serious before you get into the big stuff. Right, right, right. But uh, they, they all get the job done. Uh, have these nice little shears that Crescent has come out with. Metal cutting, leather. You know, I think Hal actually uses these. He keeps them in his, uh, his vest for pruning branches, and then also, I think he's dressed some game with it. That's got, so. and that's got a nice serrated edge on that one, on that one blade. Yes, sir. And, and really, the, the, the quality of the weight and the feel and the ergonomics of it, they're, they're really nice. Fits right in your hand. Go ahead, this, I love this one. Ergonomics, there you go. So, this, not just the pliers. Flip it over, now you have a strippers, which, Two tools in one, but it doesn't sacrifice the integrity. You know, sometimes you get multiple tools yeah. that can do two jobs, 
but there's a weak point. These do not have a weak point. And, and, and like if you're doing some electrical work around the house, yeah. it's, th those are two great tools to have. A good, a very good set of pliers and cutters, and then the ability for wire stripping. The Crescent brand has really evolved. Um, their hand tool line has been exceptional for us. To go above and beyond, they've also created some saw blades, which has been the key saw blade for us to utilize in all our cutting equipment for uh, Matabo tools. And folks, I've seen, I've seen these little guys in action. These blades take a beating. At the same time, they give you that performance cut that you need in doing trim work. So folks, Crescent, Crescent Tools, uh, trusted partner of Renovation Hunters. Take a look online. If you're looking for some tools for, for hubby or the significant yep. other, man, it's, it's some great, great accessory tools. Check them out. See you next time. Hey folks, Steve Stack, Bear Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Uh, we're back at Studio 3B, joined by Kevin Tarkovich and uh, our buddy and new friend from Renovation Hunters. And you brought some tools along. Man, what a great idea. Hey, this is the second key element in our Renovation Hunters. I mean, we have the Baird Brothers product line. We have the tools to install it. Yeah. Let me tell you what, um, they've taken a beating. You know, this isn't new tools sitting here. This is the stuff that has been through our three builds and they're still performing flawlessly. And I can't say enough about Metabo coming on as one of our sponsors for the show, what tools they have, have uh, supplied us with and the quality. You know what I was impressed with? Whatever tool I had a chance to put in my hands or operate, whether it be this seven and a quarter slide compound, or that nice little 10 inch job site table saw, I could not believe the length of the life of the battery. Yeah, definitely with the battery life alone is something that draws you to it. Because, you know, we've been in the business that long, you know the evolution of the batteries. Yep. And you have a little bit of skepticism. When you see a battery tool, especially a chop saw, compound miter, table saw, we were ripping two by 12s through a table saw using the 36 volt battery. This little guy really, and, and you had everything. You had the seven and a quarter, you had some of the big tens and that the guys were using uh, more or less as a chop saw for, for framing uh, on the one job site. But this little guy for a trimmer, it's spot on. Everybody wants to grab the seven and a quarters because they're lightweight, you take it in and out. You know, it's not where you have to set up your cut station. I had it the other day doing a, a renovation in a kitchen and brought it in, set it on what's going to be the future island, cut a few pieces of crown, put it in the truck, done. Yeah. You know, and the nice thing is there's no cords, there's nothing, it's a battery yep. and you're good to go. Yeah, and this, this normally has a nice little dust collection bag on it and so forth. Uh, this is a little mighty might. That's a great little compact screw gun, right? Uh, impact, if I'm not mistaken. Great tool. But let's go back to the Baird Brothers side. Something that goes to our products. That palm sander. The palm sander. Huh? They just recently released these battery palm sanders. The, the simplicity of grabbing one to go sand something, right? You know, we put in some of these awesome butcher block tops. So we're using the router. We go ahead and ease the edge off there. And the next thing you know, before you get ready to seal it, someone has a palm sander out. They're finishing everything up. And these palm sanders, the longevity, again, in the battery is phenomenal. It doesn't tease you with it. When you take one of these out with a fully charged battery and you have the battery indication light on there, yep. giving you all the bars, you know you're ready to go, and and I've, I've I've had the fortune of having a lot of a lot of different uh, woodworking equipment in my hands and stuff, and I, I was impressed. You can't see it on 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 the camera. This thing has some weight to it. 
you can go in, do your routing, not worry about this little trim router bouncing around, chattering on you, mm -hmm. because everything is substantial. I was thoroughly impressed. I think they've done a nice job on this on this uh, battery product line. I want to thank you for introducing it to us. Yeah, Metabo HTP. Um, I know they have it on their website. The box stores carry it. Another awesome feature is their price point on this. You know, you look at some places and you're paying for a name. Yeah. This one, you're you are coming out way ahead. You're in the green. They've done a nice they've done a nice job with it, so, folks. Check it out. Matabo Woodworking Tools. Kevin, Steve, thank you. Always a pleasure, buddy. Stay tuned, folks. More coming your way.